All right, everybody. Uh, thank you again for sticking around for the second talk, and you will be true heroes if you stay for the third talk from Mari. Um, so this is really different. Um, I stumbled into being interested in early Earth and early terrestrial planets because uh, I was just mostly a Himalayan guy before. Um, so this talk is about how the early Earth might resemble uh, somewhere else, and that all terrestrial planets may resemble this one. Does anybody know what this is? I wouldn't have known. This is real. It's a picture. Mercury. No. no. <laughs> it's EO. EO or IO, depends on how you like to pronounce it. The Westerners have no agreement. Some of us say EO, some of us say IO. So say whatever you want. Um, IO or EO, it is the innermost moon of Jupiter. This is the, so Jupiter has four Galilean moons, uh, Callisto, EO, Ganymede, and Europa. And they're all, those are the big moons of Jupiter, right? And they're all basically terrestrial bodies, uh, but EO is terrestrial with terrestrial material at the surface. The others have ices at the surface. Um, and it's the innermost one, the one closest to Jupiter. And these moons have a weird resonance. So the big three are in this one, two, four resonance. So they're, one is whipping around four times for the time that one, another one's going around once, et cetera. What this means is that you have EO as a terrestrial body. It's only slightly bigger than the moon. I show it the same size as Earth just to make a comparison, but really this is just slightly bigger than the moon. But it's whipping around Jupiter. Jupiter is a huge gravitational source, but so are the other moons. So the other moons are constantly, all the moons are pulling on each other and Jupiter's pulling on all of them. And so all of these moons are constantly getting flexed they're tidally pulled on, right? It's just like the, the ocean tides. The, the, the moons are experiencing those, but they're much bigger tides. And these tidal forces are strong enough to essentially flex EO. So EO is constantly getting tugged on to the extent that in its internals, it's getting pulled on enough for frictional heating. So just like we all do this to try and stay warm in the wintertime, EO is forced to do this all the time. And so EO is really, 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 really hot. EO loses 40 times the amount of heat per any area that Earth does. So it's a terrestrial body. It probably has a core, has a mantle, has a lithosphere, similar to Moon, Mercury, Mars, Venus, Earth. But it loses 40 times more heat than Earth does. So one of the things that we can do by looking at EO is dream a little bit about early Earth. Because early Earth, early Venus, early Moon, early Mercury, the heat source on all of those bodies is not dominantly tidal, right? So it's not dominantly frictional heating. The heat source is dominantly radioactive. And radioactivity diminishing with time means that early Earth, early Venus, early Mars, they were hot. They were much hotter than what we know today. And so if we're trying to think of what a hot terrestrial body would do, EO is an interesting place to look. And so in this talk, we'll constantly be making comparison to EO to try and see if that's useful for understanding parts of the early Earth and early terrestrial body records. So we'll look at the implications of an EO style model and compare them to the records of early Mars, early Venus, but mostly mostly early Earth. All right, so some of the questions that we're posing is why do we have plate tectonics? How do we have plate tectonics? When did it start? And especially today, what came before? And then for other terrestrial bodies and the Earth, Earth is really different, right? We have plate tectonics nobody else does. Venus has all these uh, deformation bands all around it. Mars has a hemispheric dichotomy. The, the north is different from the south. Mercury looks more like the moon. They all look pretty different. And so a dominant hypothesis is that maybe they all started as magma oceans, just entirely molten. But from there, 
The dominant thought is that every terrestrial body has been really different since that time. And we are going to argue the opposite. We are going to argue that they all were like EO. They all developed lithospheres, early lithospheres, the same. And then from there, there's small differences, but nothing major. So for early Earth, in terms of the models we usually talk about, we're usually talking about, <coughs> okay, did we have, did we have plate tectonics from the very beginning? People look at zircons from the very beginning and they think, oh, they look kind of cold, probably as plate tectonics. And other people look at the early volcanic records, huge amounts of volcanics and totalite, trondromite, granite diorite rocks, the, the famous TTG suite. And they say, oh, it's probably plumes, right? So there's a lot of plume models to develop early lithosphere. And this is kind of the bulk of the discussion. Whereas if we look at EO, that's a really different perspective. This is, this is actually real imagery. This is five images taken over eight minutes by NASA's probe New Horizons, which flew by Jupiter in 2007. And so you take those five images and you just turn them into a GIF, stack them on top of each other and keep it playing. And you see a volcanic plume. You can fly by this thing and see a volcano going off. The volcanism is a mixture of silicate and sulfurous volcanism. And the sulfur gets really high. So you see the sulfuric plume of this volcanism way high above EO. Again, this is only slightly bigger than the moon. This is a more recent image of, of the, essentially the heat from EO. And you can see that all around EO, there are volcanic calderas, tons and tons of hot spaces, lava lakes, etc. And you can see that in sort of a semi-true color image, similarly, you see just pocket marks of volcanic systems everywhere, the yellow from the sulfur. So EO's lithosphere is volcanism, 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 and more volcanism. The model that was developed for EOS, uh, to understand the EOS lithosphere first comes from these guys, O'Reilly and Davies, and in 1981. <clears throat> what they recognized is that we think EO is resurfacing at about a centimeter per year, which is, if we put that into plate tectonic terms, that's 10 kilometers per million years. A centimeter per year is a plate tectonic rate. So this is, again, it's the rate of resurfacing, the rate of deposition of volcanic material as a global average is 10 millimeters, one centimeter per year as a global average. So we are putting material at the surface of EO at a rate at which a, plate, a slow plate moves, like a really fast geological rate. The lithosphere itself is only thought to be about 50 kilometers thick. So if you have a 50 kilometer thick lithosphere, but you put 10 kilometers of new material at the top every million years, then everything's got to fall down. The material to put the 10 kilometers here, you've got to take this material from the mantle and, and rocket it up with, via volcanism. So it moves up via volcanism, dumps out, You've hollowed things out, things fall down. So the Ionian lithosphere is a strange vertical conveyor belt where you stack stuff at the surface and it moves down. And the rate of stacking things at the surface is the same as the rate of downwards motion of lithosphere. And at the base, it warms up, is reabsorbed back into the mantle, melts again. So this is really weird because you have a plate tectonic rate of vertical lithospheric motion. So something that this does is, is there any, how many active volcanoes in Mongolia? Is there an active volcano? No. No active volcanoes. Okay, but you've seen some active volcanoes in Japan. Many of you, it seems like maybe two thirds of the room went to Tohoku University. 
Um, possibly, possibly I am exaggerating, but a lot of you have seen active volcanic systems in Japan. And if there is an active flow, I don't know how many flows there really are, but there's some, right? And definitely in Kyushu. Uh, so if there's an active flow, when are you willing to walk around on it? Would you walk around on it the next year? If there was a, a, a volcanic eruption, you would walk around on it the next year. I think you'd be perfectly comfortable just walking on the whole thing the next year, if, if it stopped moving for a year. A year is not a lot of time. That volcanic material carried a lot of heat to the surface. All of that heat was lost to space, right? All of that heat went into the atmosphere. It's gone. So the same thing on EO. On EO, we're dumping tens of kilometers, like 10 kilometers per million years of volcanic material at the surface. But the volcanic material is very quickly at surface temperature. The heat is lost to space, which means it's cold. It's super, super, super cold. It's the surface temperature. And what is very strange here is it's moving down. It's moving down super fast. So you're taking cold material and you are shoving it down really fast. Again, you move 50 kilometers in 5 million years. No part of this lithosphere is older than 5 million years. So it's all moving down really rapidly, which means you are taking cold surface materials to great depth very, very quickly. And this is a real defining feature of the EO lithosphere. It's a super, super hot planet. And because it's so super hot, it dumps a ton of volcanic material at the surface. And the volcanic material is very quickly cold. So the lithosphere is super cold. It's a great paradox for a very, very hot terrestrial body. The hottest terrestrial body we have has the coldest lithosphere that we know of. Because you lose all that heat to space and then shove the surface temperature downwards. So there is a huge, huge thermal transition at the base of the lithosphere. The mantle is kept warm by the frictional heating. The lithosphere is kept super cold by the downwards advection of surface temperature. And the transition is chaos. The transition is an incredible rise in temperature. So it's an extremely weird thermal gradient compared to what we are used to. There's, uh, let's come back to this. Let's look at this thermal gradient first. So these are, this is a geothermal gradient plot. You know geothermal gradient plots. This one is strange. Like a normal modern geothermal gradient, this would be temperature on your x-axis and depth or pressure on your y-axis. Modern Earth's geothermal gradient is something like this. And then it sort of cools, it turns over near the mantle. But if you have these downwards advection rates, so this is EO's rate of downwards motion of lithosphere. This is an order of magnitude slower, an order of magnitude slower. With those kind of rates, you're carrying the surface temperature all the way down until you rapidly warm up at the base of the mantle, which we approximate with the dry peridotite solidus, the, sorry, the base of the lithosphere. So the bottom of the lithosphere, everything warms up incredibly, but you carry those surface temperatures almost unchanged to the near the bottom of the lithosphere. This is the key strange thing about this system. And it's a key strange thing we can consider when we look at early earth rocks also. If the rate is slower, then the effect is less pronounced, right? If the rate is a slower rate, you're still carrying cold surface temperatures down, but there's the advection downwards, advection of cold material, and it is countered by conductive warming from below. So what we're used to in the lithosphere now is radioactive warming and conductive warming. And so you have a little bit of radioactive and a little bit of conductive here, but mostly you're carrying cold surface temperatures down. And if the rate is slower again by an order of magnitude, it's kind of a balance. Still weird for today, but there's some conductive cooling from below, or sorry, conductive warming from below, and there's still downwards cooling of carrying cold surface material downwards, okay? So understanding that weird thermal pattern for the structure, the thermal structure of the lithosphere is important for understanding how we think about EO 
So there's a, a couple of other things happening on EO. We talk about carrying these things down, but we're carrying them down in a sphere. So the outer surface of the sphere is yay big, but then they're all going down into a smaller and smaller area of a sphere if everything's just going down. So there must be contraction. You have to shorten that sphere. And what EO does is it creates gigantic mountains in order to accommodate that contraction. And it's an indicator of how cold that lithosphere is that it can support these ridiculous mountains. Because they're like block uplifts. They're massive, huge blocks, something like 20 kilometers high. Just huge, huge mountain blocks supported by a really cold and thus really strong lithosphere. Because that lithosphere has to contract as, it, as all its material moves downwards. So again, a very strange world. We stimulate this kind of a pattern for early Earth. Uh, now, this is me and my colleague. My colleague does all the simulations, so I can just try to explain it to you. Uh, what he's doing is mantle convection code. So if you ever have visits from like the Swiss at, at ETH, uh, ETH in, in, in Zurich, they do a lot of this kind of coding where they just make a computer model of the mantle and it's meant to trace paths of mantle flow in different situations. And this model here is one of those, but it is the absolute out of the box model. This is the very most standard model ever. If they sent you their basic code, it would be this with no f bells or whistles, nothing fancy. Everything is totally normal. There's only one thing that we do differently. If in this model, a melt is produced, then in the next time step, we take that melt volume, whatever the volume of the melt was, we move it up to the surface and just put it at the surface and we put it at the surface at surface temperatures. So we're also, you can see that there's these three numbers, these three panels. They're just different amounts of heat. So this is really hot. Rayleigh number is really high. The little hot, the little cooler. And all of these is just bulk standard mantle with some internal melting. Really, really hot, a little cooler, a little cooler. If it's really, really, really hot, a lot of melt is produced. If in this modeling a lot of melt is produced, then we move it to the surface as volcanic material, and then we drop it to surface temperatures. So a ton of volume of melt means a ton of surface temperature stuff piled up at the top, and then if another melt parts goes there, then we pile that up and drop everything else down. So we keep piling up cold stuff, dropping everything down. So you can see with the really hot mantle, you end up with a really thick, really cold lithosphere it's kind of bumpy at the base, right? Because the mantle is not happy about this. The mantle's super hot. You're shoving really cold stuff at it. It's trying to warm it like crazy. So it warms a pocket here, but then that creates a ton of melt, and so it pumps all the melt up at the top. Like if it manages to eat it in the lithosphere, it's going to have a lot of decompression melting, and then boom, a lot more stuff, and then you end up in a situation like this. So tons of melting, tons of volcanic deposition, tons of downwards invection, all fighting each other in a cycle. If it's a little cooler, there's less melting, so there's less volcanics at the surface, so the downwards invection rate is slower, the system looks a little bit more normal, the base is a little flatter because it's a little bit more influenced by conductive warming. Okay, so I hope this is making sense. I know this is a little weird because we, you know, we always work on Earth. So we have one lithospheric geotherm with slight variations that we think of. This is a very strange difference. We've already talked about the geothermal gradients, so we can just move on from that. So let's try and sum all of this up and get some predictions out of it. We're looking at EO. We know that EO has rapid volcanic resurfacing. So it piles up tons of volcanic material and it shoves it down because you you're hollowing out to get the material, move the mass to the surface, everything else falls down. So it's a conveyor belt of cold coming down that refrigerates the lithosphere. 
but then it's really hot in the mantle, so there's a sharp thermal transition. Because things are moving down in the sphere, there must be contraction, so there is mountain building. There's no obvious need for extension, but there may be some as things jostle around. So our predictions. If we want to look at the early Earth or early terrestrial body geological record and say, could this make any sense for it? We need to pull some geological predictions out. So the first geological prediction is just a ton of volcanic material. If EO is happening elsewhere, then volcanism was happening, right? Anything like EO means just volcanism, volcanism, volcanism. We should see rapid, very fast volcanic resurfacing in early Earth if this model is to apply. We may well have a low geothermal gradient, although there is a caution on that, which is that most of the geothermal gradients we see in the rock record are the peak geothermal gradient that that chunk of lithosphere has experienced. It may have had a low geothermal gradient for a while, but then it gets one collisional event and it looks pretty hot, right? So it's kind of hard to track this one, but maybe, right? Okay, so our lithosphere should be very volcanic. It should be relatively cold if we can see the early temperatures. We might have contractional deformation, maybe not, um, but at least some, at least a little bit of contractional deformation. A difference for Earth is that the radius difference between the outer surface and the inner surface of the lithosphere is much, much less of a difference than it would be on EO, which is so much smaller. Um, and for Earth, if we had this volcanism, we eventually change to plate tectonics. We don't know when, we don't know how, we don't know why. But if we change to plate tectonics, then the cooling system is very different. And there should be a rapid decrease in volcanism at the point where we change to plate tectonics. So these are our very, very simple predictions from an EO type model that we can look at the early Earth record, rock record, and just see do they make any sense. And the short story is that, yeah, it actually works for the first third of Earth history, which is kind of astonishing. So the places to really look at this is you want really well-preserved rocks that are older than about 3 billion years old. Because after 3 billion years old, there's just progressively more and more evidence that probably something like plate tectonics was operating. But prior to 3 billion years old, it's pretty fuzzy. There's not much preserved, but what there is preserved are greenstone belts with totalite trondromite granite diorites mixed in. And those are weird, right? Those might be explicable in this model. So the best preserved ones are the Barberton greenstone belt, the Pilbara greenstone belt, and the Ishua supercrustal belt. Now we work a lot in Ishua, I'm not going to show you any of that work. If I come back again, I'll show you all about it. It would just take a long time. Um, and we work a little bit in Pilbara. So we've seen these rocks. Uh, oh, and also another thing is, is zircons. If you want to get older than 4 billion years old and have an earth rock record, all you have is zircons. So people study the crap out of those zircons, just trying to figure out if they can tell us anything about how and when they were generated and, and why they were generated. So those are the records we can use to investigate this period. And the short story is that they all look very similar. So this is a map of Barberton. This is a map of Pilbara. This is East Pilbara. This portion of this map, the, the, the right portion of the Pilbara area, that is the part that is 3.2 and older, 3.2 billion years old and older. After that, there's reasonable evidence for plate tectonics. But before that, you only see two colors. I can show you a much more complicated map of Pilbara, but it still just basically boils down to those two colors. The greens are surface deposits, mostly volcanics, mostly mafic volcanics. These are classic greenstones. So the greenstones are wet mafic volcanic rocks with a few surface sediments mixed in, mostly chemical sediments out of the ocean, uh, and a few more felsic layers. And then the reds are tonalite, trondromite, granite diorite. 
Now, you guys probably, so many of you are such experts at igneous processes, I am not. Uh, but my understanding of reading the totalite trungemite granodiorite literature, it ends up being pretty simple. Those rocks are melts of wet mafic volcanic rocks. So you have layers dominated by the wet mafic volcanic rocks, and you have melts of wet mafic volcanic rocks. And that is the entirety of what you see older than 3.2 billion years old. Everything is either a wet mafic volcanic rock or a melt thereof. So if you're thinking in a really gross term, everything's a wet mafic volcanic rock. Because if you heat up the wet mafic volcanic rock, then you get the tonalites. They reflect original mass that was a wet mafic volcanic rock. This means that the early Earth record prior to 3 billion years ago was super, super, super simple. It was wet mafic volcanic rocks, some of which got hot enough to melt. So possibly they got that hot at depth. And that fits our model, right? So again, we were, the major thing was, do we see rapid volcanic resurfacing? The major record is of wet mafic volcanic rocks and melts of wet mafic volcanic rocks. Pilbara yeah. and Barberton look like they're a little cold. The Hadean zircons look like they're a little cold. So the low geothermal gradient, maybe. Contractional deformation, yes, but nothing major and nothing definitive. And it's also hard to tell if it's actually that time. There's, there's mostly what you see is diapiric patterns where the TTGs, the tonalite transverse trongemite granite diorites rise into the, because they're relatively less dense versus the wet mafic volcanics. And this we definitely see. Barberton, Pilbara, these are like 20 kilometer thick stacks developed over 300 million years. It is a lot of material for Earth to develop, a lot of thickness of wet mafic volcanics to develop in a relatively short amount of time. Nothing like that develops in our current plate tectonic context. There is no place on Earth where you can go and see the same volcanism last in one spot for 300 million years, just completely continuous. Well, sort of semi-episodically. Every 50 million years or so or 20 million years, there's another pulse. And it's always the same type of material. This makes it a pretty different world. But it does potentially fit with the EO style model. Okay, so now we talk about other planets. This gets even a little simpler. What are they made of? So this is EO. Uh, obviously, it's all from volcanoes. All of that surface is from volcanoes. Earth? Okay, some of it is not lava, right? Some of Earth's surface is not lava. Actually, most of Earth's surface is still lava. Okay, the moon? The moon is lava. Maybe some of its flotation, but it's still igneous stuff. Mars, lava and dust, dust of lava. This is dominantly what you see on Mars. Venus, lava, deformed lava. Mercury, all lava. So the rocky terrestrial bodies are dominated by lava. All of those surfaces of all of those lithospheres are all volcanic. And for the most part, they're mafic to ultramafic lavas. The moon's mafic stuff is kind of weird, but for the most part, it's mafic. Okay? This is not complicated. Everybody knows this. But it's a little weird that it's so uniform. So let's compare it to those predictions from the from the heat pipe model, from the, the, the EO style model. Rapid volcanic resurfacing? Well, if everything is lava, maybe. Right? Low geothermal gradient? Uh, we really can't tell from here. Right? How do we know? How are we going to know? Contractional deformation? A bit? Wrinkle ridges? That kind of stuff? Maybe? Uh, rapid decrease in volcanism after the initiation of plate tectonics? Well, the other terrestrial bodies didn't initiate plate tectonics to the best of our knowledge. There are some ideas that maybe there was some localized subduction in response to impacts, but there's no global plate network that's ever been really thought of. It's something kind of like it proposed for Venus, but it's not very persuasive. Um, so that doesn't apply. If we do not initiate plate tectonics, 
then we would not destroy an early lithosphere. We would keep the early lithosphere. If we keep the early lithosphere, then we have a lot to work with because we're, this is a model for the early lithosphere. We're saying that early when it's hot, it would be like EO. So if we don't destroy it, then we can interrogate it more, more thoroughly. So in the absence of plate tectonics, the model predicts that we should preserve a thick and strong early lithosphere. Now the thick and strong is different because most models, because most people, the early earth, for better or worse, it's two people. There's geochemists and there's geodynamicists. The geochemists are not so good at spatial thinking. No offense. That's what we structural geologists are all about. We like spatial thinking. What's the geometry? What's the motion? Geochemists just don't do it as often. The geodynamicists don't put simple stiff in their code. They didn't put volcanism in their code. We added the volcanism with the stupid thing we did here, like a little bit of melt pile up on the top. It's a very simple abstraction. It wasn't there at all. So there's simple processes that the geodynamicists leave out. When the geodynamicists make a lithosphere, they make it via conductive cooling. It is the surface rind that is simply exposed to cold space, so it gets cold, and to cool through that lithosphere, it is only by conduction. So they're not considering volcanism. So if we think of the standard geodynamic pattern, for an early lithosphere. This is time moving forward. And if you're just gonna do it with conduction, then when the planet's really hot, it's really hard to have much of a lithosphere because you've got so much heat to lose, right? So, so much heat has to go out to space. But as time moves on, it can get a little thicker. So you have a thin early lithosphere. It won't be that strong. It'll be pretty weak because it's pretty thin but you'll be able to get a lot of heat through it conductively. And as time moves further and further and further and further on, it will thicken and thicken and thicken until you get something that looks like Mars or the moon, a nice, thick, strong lithosphere today. But the standard geodynamic models start thin because they only use conduction. When we use volcanic advection, you see that something really weird happens. The earlier it is, is the hotter it is. So, for it's really being hot, you have a really thick, strong lithosphere. And as time moves forward, radioactivity diminishes, volcanism diminishes, piling up volcanic material at the surface diminishes. So the rate of downwards advection is a little slower and there's more conductive warming from below. So paradoxically, the lithosphere is thinning. A heat pipe lithosphere starts from a magma ocean, but it almost immediately gets crazy thick and then thins until the volcanism wanes to the point where it's indistinguishable from a regular stagnant lid, which never had any volcanism. Okay? So a heat pipe gives you a really different set of predictions because you're going to start super thick versus starting super thin. And then later, they'll start to merge. Later, heat pipe will thin and conduction will thicken. So these are two very different ways of looking at the thermal structural evolution of an early terrestrial planet lithosphere. And they have a really different prediction. In this world, the early lithosphere is weak. In this world, the early lithosphere is super strong and it never really gets that thin. So it never really gets that weak. It stays strong. So we can preserve early things with an early, thick, strong lithosphere. We talked about that. We don't, don't, don't worry about the, the text. It doesn't matter. We talk about it. So let's look at these bodies. The moon, I didn't know this. My friend told me. It shapes more like a lemon or a football or something. Like not a soccer ball, but an American football. Shaped like a lemon. It looks circular to me, but it's not. It has a early shape of a closer synchronous rotator. When it was orbiting around the Earth much closer, the gravitational pulling on it had an influence on its shape that was much greater than today. But 
the moon is preserving that early shape. The moon still preserves that early lemon shape today that it developed very early in its history when it had to be much closer to Earth. The only way we can form it. So we have an early lithospheric shape of the moon that is preserved. Mercury has some kind of a mass distribution that's irregular that allows it to have a 3-2 resonance in its, in its, in its orbit and it versus its rotation. It's very difficult to imagine that structure forming except for early in Mercury's history, which suggests that again, we preserved an early imbalance because it could just get into hydrostatic equilibrium if it was weak. If it's strong, it can preserve that early shape. Same thing for Mars. Mars has this hemispheric dichotomy. North is a relatively thin and, and lower lithosphere. The south is the southern highlands. It's a bit thicker crust and or lithosphere. Um, it's not a mystery as how this was formed. The most dominant likely explanation is a huge impact, uh, such that this is basically a giant impact basin. The mystery is not how you form it. The mystery is how you preserve it. To preserve something that early and that dramatic, you would need a really strong lithosphere to do it. Otherwise, again, it would just fall into hydrostatic equilibrium. So all of these terrestrial bodies, other than Earth and Venus, are showing ancient topography that is supported by lithospheric stresses. And that topography has been is really old and it has not relaxed. So this is very much favoring the idea that the early lithospheres were really thick and strong and they never really got too thin because it's they've been strong enough the whole way through to preserve these kind of topographic features. That's pretty dramatic evidence against a, a really thin early conductive lithosphere. So we posit that this may be a general model for terrestrial planets because it fits all the ones we see. Even Venus, the earliest records are of contraction and, and tectonic highlands. So we, we put out this paper in, in uh, you know five, six years ago, uh, arguing that terrestrial planets move from magma ocean and then as they cool, they go through a uniform heat pipe phase and maybe large terrestrial exoplanets might still be in heat pipe um, because if they're large enough, they can retain more heat. Their surface area to volume ratio is less. Uh, but then they transfer uh, into some sort of subsolidus convection dominated either by plate tectonics or stagnant lid tectonics uh, through time. Uh, but the idea that despite their differences, they would have a really similar early pattern is, is a new idea and, and kind of fun to chase. Uh, so we're working on various aspects of looking at the other planets and especially looking at early Earth. Uh, a takeaway here is that early Earth may have tectonics that are super similar to what we're chasing on Mars, what we're chasing on Venus, right? We send out these space probes. Everybody in this room is way the heck cheaper. All of us together, you could fund us to the ends of the Earth. We're still way, way cheaper than anything NASA sends up into the sky, right? So if we're looking to explore the early development of terrestrial planets, looking at early Earth terrains might be more universal than we thought. If, if all of these planets might be explained by this rapid volcanism model, well, then we can look at it on Earth. There's not a lot preserved, but there's some preserved. So I would, I would caution that early Earth doesn't have a lot of records. There's not a lot of data because there's, there's not a lot of material, which means that a lot of different ideas are viable. Now, we talked about how the main ideas are plate versus plume. And EO is very different from that, and it's viable. So if there's any lesson from this, it's that, you know, when you have small amounts of data, many, many things are possible, right? But if it's viable, it's worth considering. So it's viable, this kind of cooling is viable for the first third of Earth history. And it also looks like it could explain a similar evolution for all of the other terrestrial bodies that we can observe in our solar system. And thus it might be a common similar pattern for all terrestrial body evolution, which is kind of exciting. So thank you very much.
So I know this is pretty weird and different. I, I stumbled into this because I asked a friend to come help me with some Himalaya modeling. And he showed me his weird early earth modeling. Uh, but he thought it made, oh, it's made sense for the Hadean Zircons. And then I thought it made sense for Barberton and Pilbara. So we started working and that was a decade ago. Um, so yeah, it's pretty different. Are there any questions? When did plate tectonics start? Is a big question. Lots of people debate. I am I'm an editor for a journal and I get papers all the time that say 2.5, 3.2, 3.8, lots of different ideas. Um so we need like in order to prove it as plate tectonics you need to be able to prove a global plate network. And so one of the challenges is that a lot of the, uh, look, I'm not gonna answer your question. I'm gonna tell you why people can't answer your question right now, okay? The reason they can't answer your question right now is that one of the ways to answer that question is to look for evidence of subduction, right? But subduction doesn't prove a global plate network because subduction could in many viable models be localized. Subduction could even be initiated by an impact causing a rollback subduction, which may not last that long and may not take over the earth. It may just be something where you could develop a record of subduction, but then it stops. And it's only in one area of the earth. It's only it's subduction the size of China or something, right? And then it's done. Um, so, would that count as plate tectonics if it's induced by an impact and it's just a relative, it's a local rollback and then it all locks up again. Most people would say that's not plate tectonics because it doesn't involve a global plate network. So when most of the evidence we can find, most of what we can parse is, you know, it's all igneous rocks. So it's all folks like yourself looking at these igneous rocks and saying, is that a subduction signature? Yes, it is. Yes, we had plate tectonics. And then other people are like, well, not so fast. You have a subduction signature that doesn't require plate tectonics. And then there's me. I'm a problem because the subduction signature is no longer defined as a subduction signature. The subduction signature, the major key thing for a subduction signature is the ability to say you took surface materials down to great depth. You took surface materials down to the mantle. Right, And then you see that geochemistry processed and you see that geochemistry affecting things like the tonalite, trondromite, granodiorite chemistry. But most of what they are arguing for in these subduction signatures for early Earth is slab melting. They are arguing that a subducted slab, a slab of early oceanic material was brought down and rather than release fluids and melt the mantle wedge, most of what they are arguing that they are seeing is the slab itself melting internally to produce total trondromite granodiorite, okay, which is totally fine. Maybe in a hotter earth that would work. That's viable. The problem for them in terms of uniqueness, for that being a unique subduction record, that's unlikely. And the reason is... It's not unique in this world because you do the same thing here. Here's your oceanic plate, right? You're dumping a bunch of mafic and ultramafic volcanics, mostly mafic at the surface. And then you're taking them to great depth. And when you take them to great depth, especially with a thermal transition right here, some of them are gonna melt. And there's your TTGs. So you have slab melting in this world and you have slab melting in the, in the posited early subduction zones. And all of it has signatures of surface material because this whole atmosphere is from the surface. All of it was deposited at the surface and shoved down. So, and you can carry water that way too, right? The, the big thing is, oh, but you got so much water down there. How would you do that without subduction? Well, this is below an ocean. And some of that water gets into these rocks via you know hot springs and stuff like that or just metamorphism or, or you know, low-grade hydrothermal systems, 
you lock in a bunch of water and you carry it, just like with subduction. So what this has complicated is the ability to take a subduction record and know that it, to take a magmatic record that clearly shows that some of this melted material was from the surface, it is no longer possible to say that that must have been caused by subduction because this can do it too. So we've just taken away a lot of tools for saying this is when you had subduction, so you had plate tectonics then. All the past work at Ishwa is along the lines I just told you. All the past work at Ishwa is saying, look, like Ali Polat, those guys, we have got subduction signatures in these rocks because they are melting things that were at the surface. Yeah, they were melting things that were at the surface, but subduction is not the only way to do it. So that's made things messier. So a lot of people were saying that Ishwa is plate tectonic, which would mean that plate tectonics is operating at at least 3.7 million years old. But now we take those records and can alternatively interpret them. So maybe not. A lot of people say 3.2. We tend to favor that. At 3.2 and a little later, there are some pretty substantial extensional bases. And this model doesn't have a great way of making extensional bases. So at least in our universe, which is, you know, all models are, you know, arguable and probably wrong. We don't have a way of doing that. So the only way for us to do it in this context would be something like plate tectonics or some other process, not heat pipe. Um, and other people want to argue that uh, BIFs are hugely responsible for some aspect of the chemical or physical changes of how subduction zones will operate and permitting subduction zones to operate. So they like a big 2.5 pulse to start things. A final thing along these lines is that you could have episodes of global plate tectonics that then lock up again. So it may be that we had partial or global subduction catastrophes, huge episodes of plate tectonic activity that then locked up and then you have a stagnant lid again. And you could do that, you know, 3.2, 2.7, 2.5, 1.8. Those could be, rather than evidence of continuous plate tectonics, those could be evidence of a dramatic uh, overturn style of, of uh, temporary plate tectonics before locking up again. I think that's what Bob Stern favors, who's a big guy that explores that kind of a question. And I think he favors like an 800 to 500 even. But even that late, onset of continuous global plate tectonics. So, oh, and then finally, I would say one of my other supervisors, Mark Harrison, is of the fervent opinion that the Hadean zircons, 4.3, 4.2, 4.1, are showing water records and pressure and temperature depth records that suggest plate tectonics even that far back. Now, we think we can explain it this way, uh, but, you know, he, we, we start getting into the weeds, my point is you have some people saying you go from magma ocean directly to plate tectonics. And these are credible, intelligent, really excellent scientists. And you have similarly excellent, credible, intelligent people with working with the data very well, arguing that continuous plate tectonics is as young as 600 MA. And that's the state of play. So plate tectonics is a theory. It's really well understood and well developed and well documented and well proved as the active system that governs our mantle and lithosphere. But we do not have anything like consensus on when and how and why plate tectonics started. So with the Himalayan example, we have a hundred years of knowing that it is India under thrusting Asia. That is the first order answer and we have known it for a hundred years and it is not gonna change. The first order answer for, for your question is still open. It's a great question. It is the question. Okay, it's interesting. Thank you. So should we take another break? Unfortunately, geochemistry is very similar. Geochemistry has a ton of power. 
Geodynamic modeling has a ton of power. Structural geology has a ton of power. We just have different power, right? So we work together as much as we can to combine forces. The Precambrian, the latest sort of this snowball earth thing, is due to like a, a lot of volcanism, right? I'm the wrong guy for this question. I really just don't know. Okay. <laughs> I love that stuff. I love, I'm really interested in their talks. I don't do anything about it. Uh, I I don't know. Ryan would, Ryan would totally answer that. And I think I don't know how debated that is. I know people are worried about volcanics as like a big drawdown of certain like, like promoting a lot of weathering or something like this, you know. But I, I really don't know. Yeah, sorry. I, I studied it early, I studied the active, and I don't know much in between. Oh well, okay. So we can ask questions more. We'll take like another yeah. 10 minute break. Uh, oh yeah, okay. By your talk, uh, it's an uh, early uh, history of all different planets. It's almost the same. Early because, history of what? Because all, all soups is covered by volcanic rocks. Eh? Yeah. For three planets. Yes. And uh, why other three planets is uh, just stopped after the I, I told you. But uh, our Earth is developed differently. What is it? We're bigger. So the the big question is why is Venus different? Because Venus is about the same size. The other ones are smaller, so they have uh, a much bigger surface area to volume ratio, and so they lose their heat quicker, um, and they develop. They never really get managed to overcome the strength of their lithosphere, which is relatively thick versus the radius. Um, so the small ones, they just have less heat. So they die earlier. Earth has is bigger, so it has more radioactive elements, and it has critically uh, a much smaller surface area versus its versus its volume. So it cools more slowly, um, and so it's it's still hotter. Now Venus is roughly the same size. So why doesn't Venus have plate tectonics? Is an interesting question. There are a variety of conceptual understandings for that. My favorite is from a guy called uh, Shun Carano at Yale, where, and, and he worked with a guy from Singapore, uh, who's now at USC, I forget his name. Uh, Carano and Barbeau, Sylvan Barbeau. So these guys in 2018 or 19 published a paper in Scientific Reports, which is super fun, because they're asking why does Earth have plate tectonics and Venus doesn't? And they think it's about the ability of the oceanic plate to bend. So the oceanic plate has to be weak enough to bend to subduct, right? And that's, they think that they, the strength of the oceanic mantle lithosphere is the most important part of the equation because because that can that stuff bend or go in or not. So they need to make that weak in order for plate tectonics to operate. Venus has a higher surface temperature Earth has a lower one. That's the big difference at the surface. It's like 400 degrees hotter because of the atmosphere insulating things. So if the boundary condition is that much hotter, the brittle layer of Venus's lithosphere is much, much thinner. Mostly it's a ductal lithosphere. And so if the brittle layer is so much thinner, <clears throat> then any earthquake you can generate there is going to be smaller. And they posit that you need earthquakes, large earthquakes, to effectively weaken the lithosphere because only for short amounts of time in a huge earthquake, uh, you have enough heating to just dramatically drop the strength along that earthquake fault during that earthquake. And they posit that that is the real reflection of the integrated strength of the lithosphere is, is you know, a, a chain breaks at its weakest point, right? So that's the weakest point according to them. And that's most likely to govern the long-term strength in reality, and because Earth has a big, thick, brittle layer, it can develop earthquakes of size enough to really have that heating and weakening. That's their argument. Um, yeah, but for the other ones, they just cool off too quick. So they posit that Venus can't have plate tectonics because it just can't get the lithosphere weak enough 
to allow that outer boundary layer to be involved in the convective flow, whereas Earth's outer boundary layer is weak enough to be involved in the mantle convective flow. Um, and that's the difference according to them. There are other models. That's my favorite one. So, uh, you know, people people don't have a definite answer yet. Thank you. Great question. <laughs>